there was one misconception that you could dispel about autism, what would it be? Oh, um, I think I'd like people to stop seeing it as a mental health issue. And it is such a pleasure to have you on the platform. You are a chaser on the chase, one of Britain's most popular TV shows around at the moment. You're known as the governess. And That's it's right. It's an absolute honour to have you on the platform. Thank you for inviting me. The first question I'd like to ask you is that you were born in Westminster. You studied yeah. at the University of Edinburgh. Yeah, I studied linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. And then after that, I went on and did a postgrad in uh, journalism at the University of Cardiff. Wow. And following on from that, you then went into journalism. So could you just talk to us just a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I sort of always vaguely, as a child, I mean, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I thought maybe I would be a writer because my uh, grandfather was a publisher. Um, and so I was always reading books. Um, I never was really very much of a writer, to be honest. Um, but uh, I just thought, you know, if you're going to be a writer, the way to make money from that used to be a journalist. So, uh, so I went into journalism. And then after about 10 years, it dawned on me that I didn't actually enjoy being edited. I wanted to be the one doing the editing. So I moved into book publishing uh, and spent 20 years um, copy editing manuscripts and reading proofs, uh, which really was much more interesting. Thank you. And even following on from that, you then became a TV personality. So in all of that, yeah. what influenced that ambition? Um, I don't know. I know that I always, um, as I've said in a previous interview with The Guardian, I just always wanted to be famous. Uh, but I didn't really know what I could actually be famous at. And I'd sort of pretty much given up the idea of, of that I would ever become famous. And then basically, you know, the best job in the world just fell into my lap. So uh, it really was, um, it really was accidental. Um, I happened to have uh, discovered um, the existence of high level quizzing, discovered I was quite good at it and discovered that um, the chase might well be looking that this very new show that had just gone out um, with just two chasers, Mark and Sean, might well be looking for a female chaser. And it was just all those things that happened simultaneously. So really, it was a massive accident. Thank you. And following on from that, in an interview with Entertainment Daily, you talked about your experience with regards to bullying. Yeah, um, I was bullied as a child. Um, I mean, I think any any odd child gets bullied. And although nobody knew in those days what Asperger's syndrome was, they didn't know that there was an autistic spectrum. And they figured, you know, if you could talk and were at least minimally functional, then you were not actually autistic. So I just simply got, you know, bullied for being odd. Um, it stopped. Uh, it stopped as I got older and went to a school where bullying was stamped on. Um, and as I learned to have more of a sense of humor about myself, to be honest, because the kid that will get bullied is the kid that um, that makes it worth the bully's while. To, to bully them and you know if you're just sort of laughing it off then it's not as much fun for that's incredible and your and your resilience is incredible so i'd like to just ask well, you I wasn't very resilient as a child i just kind of learned it as i got older thank you thank you for clarifying that and what advice would you give to young people that might be going through bullying um learn to take the mick out of yourself uh learn to be funny um I mean, sometimes you can just, uh, there's a story, I mean, a um, hundred or so years old about a writer called Alexander Walcott, who was at university, and uh, he wasn't very popular. Uh, and a man, one, uh, one of his fellow students came up to him and said, I suppose you're the most unpopular person on this campus. And he said, yes, I think you're probably the most popular. And the guy sort of went, whoa, I think I just got a compliment there. I have no idea how to deal with it. Um, so he just sort of wandered off looking dazed. Thank you. And um, even following on from that, The Chase is listed 13th on YouGov's poll of the most popular British TV shows of all time. Fantastic. Please tell us a bit about how you came to join The Chase. Uh, as I say, chapter of accidents. Uh, everything suddenly happened quite quickly around um, uh, 2009. Um, I discovered the existence of the um, quizzing circuit in April, um, went along to my first quiz in May. Um, while I was there, I passed an audition to be on the program Are You an Egghead, which is to find another egghead. 
um, filmed those in May, came third. Um, in June, met Mark Labatt, who told me uh, that he'd just done this little um, pilot series called The Chase, and I should watch it. And by July, I was being asked, you know, if the show gets picked up for a full series, would you be interested in being a chaser? So, I mean, literally, you know, it was about three months um, to, to me sort of actually thinking, wow, something might actually come of this. And then I got offered the job the following January after a series of, of auditions. And basically, that's how it happened. It was just all a tremendous rush and I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Thank you. And even following on from that, you're actually one of the most successful chasers in terms of your win percentage is about 79.3%. So what oh. advice would you give to somebody that wants to be a great quizzer like you? Well, um, I mean, compared to a lot of other quizzers, I'm not actually that brilliant. In the world championships, I would reckon I'm, I'm doing well if I get in the top 100 because there are so many superb quizzes out there and there are so many superb quizzes in the UK. Um, if you want to be a really good quizzer, read a lot. Um, read doesn't have to be books, can be online, can be Wikipedia, keep an eye on the news, listen to the chart shows, um, work on any weak spots. Um, be curious, just wonder about things. Uh, you know, think back to a story that was in the news a few days ago. Can you name the people or have you forgotten? If you've forgotten, go and look them up because you might come up. Um, but I, the win rate is a little deceptive because um, each of us sort of deals with teams in different ways. And, for example, I think I probably have a higher win percentage than I really merit because I – I don't quite know how I do it, but I have this ability to terrify teams. They're far more scared of me than they actually should be. Um, and they tend to crumble. They'll crumble at the table. So I quite often take out, um, you know, one or two. So uh, I'm not generally facing a full house at the end. And then at the end, they'll crumble because, again, I'm into just simply the thought of facing me is intimidating them. Uh, and uh, quite often I am... I'm winning a lot because I'm quite often not facing particularly high scores because I've managed to terrify them. And a lot of that is just simply acting and posing and giving the impression of, of being frightfully dangerous rather than, you know, actually being someone who will get all the answers right. And an, an incredible thing about you is that you're not just a chaser in the UK, you're also a chaser on the chase in Australia. That's right. Yes. So I don't, I'm hoping I'll be going out. What's it's the first of March, isn't it? Hope I'll be going out at some point in during the British summer, which is the Australian winter when we haven't got quite so much on. Um, I honestly don't yet know. In fact, one thing I want to do today is to contact the uh, Australian chasers and ask, you know, approximately, do they know when they might be filming for the rest of the year? Because the thing is with the Australian chase, with, with the British chase, We've, I mean, we've got dates right up until November. Um, we know what dates we're going to be filming. Um, the Australians very often don't. Um, very often it just sort of gets recommissioned at the last minute. Someone suddenly says, oh, we forgot to recommission that. Maybe we'll recommission it. Well, maybe we won't. That's what I think. Yeah, well, maybe we will recommission it. By which time, you know, half the crew have gone off and got jobs on other things. So we're just always dealing with tremendous turnover of crew. Um, but Australians, I, they, they like to do it that way. So yeah, I hope I'll be going out, uh, at some point in our summer. Uh, I look forward to it. It's fun to do. And which, which set of consistents are sharper in terms of quizzing Australians or UK? Well, the British have got much more of a quizzing culture in this country. You know, people do a lot more quizzes. There are quiz leagues uh, up and down the UK. There are also, you know, pub quizzes that people go to weekly or monthly. So a lot of people have uh, more experience of, of, of going quizzing than the Australians do. And the Australians, um, they have this tendency to ignore both the lower and the higher off. Uh, they just automatically think in terms it's 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 a very australian thing it's what's called the fair go um that you know you t you should take back to the table what you've earned there's no point in taking a risk for people you don't know and then there's no point in going low and and you know essentially taking money away from from people you don't know you just simply go for the money you actually earned it's a very australian thing <laughs> Australia, bring me your best, your brightest, the greatest minds your country can offer. 
because I'm going to eat them for breakfast. Yum, yum. The governess is coming to the Chase Australia on 7. <laughs> One ruler, and I'm it. It is time for the final chase. Mm -hmm. What is the capital city of New Zealand? Wellington. Correct. Four. Correct. Nine hundred. Correct. Magna. Correct. Renoir. Correct. Golf. Who can beat the governess? The chase Australia. September on seven. You know nothing, Australia, but I do. Thank you. And another thing that's coming up is international women's day on the 8th of march when you think mm. of international women's day what issue comes to your mind the most no none really i don't really think that i don't really have a particularly strong opinion about it except that some idiot on twitter is gonna gonna go international women's day when's an international men's day then as if they think there isn't one actually it's the 19th of november that's when international men's day is it's the 19th of november happy to have helped you <laughs> um, so, you know, that's, that's really the only thing I think of, but, um, I don't really, it's not something that sort of really occupies my mind very much, to be honest. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And another thing that's really cool about you is that you've been an, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. So could you tell yeah. us a bit about your time um, in the jungle? It was absolutely horrible. Um, I, I only stayed there because everyone was so nice to me. Um, and, uh, I mean, I tried to get out several times. I went to the Bush Telegraph and said, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. I can't stand this. And they said, well, um, you know, take it hour by hour, talk, talk to your campmates, talk to Medic Bob. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just, just see if you can stay in one more night, just see if you can stay in one more day. And then once the camps came together about sort of three days later, um, I found it was, I mean, it is a better camp. You know, you've actually got sort of proper washing facilities. Uh, the band camp, the bad camp's named the bad camp for, the, for a reason. Um, we didn't really like the idea of using the shower in the bad camp because it was a barrel full of water, which was pumped. Um, but what made us nervous was it looked to us as if there were little black things swimming around on top of it. And we were like, oh, my Lord, there's baby leeches in the water. There may well not have been baby leeches, of course, um, but we just sort of thought, let's, Let's not use that, shall we? Um, and getting into the good camp, you know, where everybody else used the jungle shower and I used the pool, uh, and you felt, you know, okay, I feel slightly less disgusting. Uh, and then all my um, campmates were, were very good at earning stars, so we ate pretty well. Um, and I just sort of thought, okay, calm down. Everybody's being nice to you. You can stay clean. You can wash your clothes. You can get something to eat. You know, hang in there. Um, and I did actually manage to hang in there until I was voted off uh, fifth, I think it was, fifth or sixth, fifth, something like that. Yeah, fifth. So, uh, yeah, I was like, whoa, I survived. I uh, would never do it again. And did the experience teach you anything about yourself that you didn't know before going into the job? Yeah, I'm more pathetic than I thought I was. Um, I kind of thought that I would be, you know, really quite rugged and resilient about it. And uh, I knew I didn't like spiders. I, I discovered I really didn't like anything that scuttles. I'd never really thought about disliking crabs. But, yeah, I kind of do dislike crabs because it's moving, but you're not quite sure where its eyes are. So that's, mm. that's just wrong and weird. Um, so, uh, yeah, I discovered I'm, I'm frightened of, of quite a few things. And the things I wasn't frightened of, they didn't put me up for. Mm -hmm. um so um but uh yeah i discovered i mean uh it is a massive massive showcase and it definitely did raise my profile so i'm glad i did it i'm glad i didn't run away and, and, and i'm glad i never ever have to do it again I, I think that the that the really cool thing about you is that you lasted so long in there and i think that's an achievement in itself well it was only because everybody else you know kept me there they were all so nice uh with a different bunch of people i could well have walked who can say Thank you. And you're a fan of jazz music. What are your three favourite jazz artists? Uh, I'm a fan of lots of sorts of music. Um, jazz is just one of them. Um, I tend to like the pre-war stuff. You know, once we get into bebop, I'm sort of like, OK, you know, I can understand the artistry, but it's not really for me. Um, so I tend to like the early stuff. Uh, love Jelly Roll Morton, who fascinates me. He was such a maverick uh, and managed to annoy so many people. 
Um, and uh, he always, uh, he always, he had great difficulty actually identifying as black. His first, the, the first line of his autobiography, the first chapter of his autobiography is called All My Folks Was Frenchman. Uh, well, actually, all his folks wasn't French, um, but uh, he, he just seemed to not want to acknowledge that uh, half his descent was actually African-American. And yet, at his funeral, I think there was only one white person there, and that was uh, the guy who published his music. Um, so I know there were people who deliberately stayed away from his funeral because he had annoyed them, Duke Ellington being one of them. Uh, so I do find him fascinating because he rubbed so many people up the wrong way. Um, and, uh, he, he did so many things so early on, uh, and that fascinates me. Um, I love the trombonist Jack Teagarden, who was one of the first, he and Vix Beiderbeck were, you know, for a long time, they were really the only two white musicians that black jazz musicians would actually listen to and actually think, this is interesting, I might actually, you know, learn something here as opposed to it being all, you know, the little white boys going to the Lincoln Gardens to get the music lessons. Um, so um, I like him. I love his singing. I think Jack Teagarden's singing is underrated. General Morton's singing is actually always very interesting as well. I like singing his songs. Um, and then, I mean, you really cannot, you really can't rule out Louis Armstrong because he was just so massively important. Um, and yet, I don't know. That, I mean, I, I, I also absolutely love Louis Prima who sort of seemed to me to combine jazz and rock and roll better than almost anyone else has. Um, and I mean, most people just, if they know Louis Prima at all, they know him as, um, in Disney's Jungle Book, he sang, I Want to Be Like You. Um, and, uh, and that's his actual backing band that, that you can hear on it. And, and uh, they were in the studio basically sort of larking about behaving like monkeys. Uh, and um, the, the producer actually had the, the artist come down to... Um, to um, the studio and say, you know, watch that and basically draw what they're doing. Um, so uh, I do like him as well. I don't know if anyone remembers that old um, Gap advert that used Jump, Jive and Whale. Um, but as I say, I don't really, I mean, I'd sort of really quite like to have three Louis all, all in a row, Armstrong, Jordan and Prima, uh, and say that they're all my, my, my other favourite um, jazz musician. But I like tons of other kinds of music. I mean, I listen to 40s jump blues, 50s, you know, um, rock and roll, R&B, doo-wop, 60s soul. I love Northern soul. If I could probably, if I could only ever listen to one genre for the rest of my life, it would probably be Northern soul. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's loads of stuff I listen to. Thank you. And another question I'd like to just talk, ask you about is, you mentioned in the interview with The Guardian that you always believed you would be Famous. What have been some of your positive and negative experiences with regards to fame? Oh, uh, not very many negative ones. I mean, you get the occasional pile on on Twitter. Um, and uh, I have had uh, some people have sort of somehow got hold of my phone number uh, and phoned me. And then all I hear on the other end is, is a lot of giggling and they put the phone down. Uh, my agent deals with that by um, taking the number, contacting their internet service provider and they get in touch and say, you ever do that again, and we will make sure nobody will ever rent a phone to you again. So that, that actually tends to work. Um, but, um, I mean, there are loads of positives about it. You get all sorts of sort of ridiculous privileges that I sort of feel I shouldn't get. Like um, about uh, 14 months ago, um, my car broke down, and I was on my way back from Panto in Swindon. Um, and the... Um, the RAC guy came out uh, and he said, OK, this uh, isn't something I can fix by the roadside. So uh, he took me to um, a um, car rental place, I uh, rented a car. Uh, and then he said, you know, I'll, I'll deal with this and the RAC will be in touch. Uh, so he took my car off. And then I sort of thought, I have absolutely no idea where my car has been taken to. Um, and uh, nobody seemed to know when I was sort of phoning the RAC saying, where is my car? And they didn't know. And then what my agent did was to put a tweet out on Twitter saying, can you believe the RAC have lost the governess's car? And within like half an hour, there was a very scared RAC guy um, direct messaging me saying, terribly sorry, you know, can you give us some more information? Uh, and my car was located. And um, I just imagine, you know, if I hadn't been famous, if I couldn't have got that much um attention from a tweet i might have had to wait a long time 
So not dissing the RAC there, you know, we're, they were very, very busy at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that you get all sorts of privileges from being famous. You get people, um, I mean, I've, I've, I've um, gone into pubs and ordered drinks and been told it's on the house. Uh, and I'm sort of like, but, you know, I'm probably the richest person here. Let me pay for it. Uh, but, you know, yes, it's nice. You get freebies. When I was poor and needed freebies, I didn't get any. And, and now, you know, I'm rich and can pay for stuff and I get free stuff. It's brilliant. It's wrong and unfair, but it's brilliant. It's it's still it's still a good thing at the same time. Well, right? yeah, it's nice. <laughs> and one thing that ins also inspires me about you is that you're a very committed Catholic. And yeah. mm -hmm. during your time, you know, in the jungle, you brought a prayer book with you. How does your faith impact your approach to life? Um, I did. I mean, when I got off of the jungle, one of the first things I did was to message uh, a priest friend of mine and say, uh, can I legitimately take this given that I will not be able to actually attend mass and you're not you know, supposed to do something that stops you going to mass? And he said, well, you know, there are circumstances where people can legitimately not make it to mass. And in that case, what they're encouraged to do is to take uh, is to have a mass book with them and uh, go through the mass every Sunday uh, on their own, just to sort of connect themselves to the, the wider community. Um, so uh, you could do that. So that's what I did every Sunday. I was allowed half an hour. Um, no, must have been more than half an hour. About an hour in the um, medical hut to um, just go through the mass by myself. So so that was that was really very nice to be able to do. Um, yeah, it's not the thing I, I tend to bang on about a lot. Um, but yeah, I do go to mass every Sunday and I'm quite sort of firm about that. Um, I'm giving, I'm giving up meat for Lent, uh, which I'm hating, by the way. I, I, I can't wait for Easter. <laughs> um, I, after a few days, I thought to myself, you know what? I've just realized all fish tastes the same. So I'm actually eating, um, less fish than I was and more just sort of actual vegetarian stuff. Um, mm. So, uh, but yes, I, I, I want, I want my nice chicken and bacon and, and things back. Yes, that would be lovely. Uh, I think that's incredible. I myself, I'm a Christian. So when it's nice to see, you know, Christians mm. and Catholics in the public light. So it's, mm. it's a very inspirational thing. So thank you for sharing that. That's okay. As I say, I don't tend to go on about it because I don't feel it does a lot of good. I've had people make inquiries of me and sort of, I've sort of tried to help them. Uh, and I think it's generally not gone anywhere. So I'm obviously absolutely terrible at evangelization. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I don't go on about it because it puts people off. Uh, yeah, I completely understand that. And even following on from that, I'd also like to ask you, if there was one misconception that you could dispel about autism, what would it be? Oh, um, I think I'd like people to stop seeing it as a mental health issue. I get a lot of people wanting me to get involved with mental health charities. And I have to say to them, I don't actually have any mental health issues. I don't really think I can help you here. Um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, my mental health is fine. I know so many people who suffer from depression and anxiety and uh, intrusive thoughts and goodness knows what. And uh, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I don't have those issues. Um, I would like, I suppose I would like people to understand it takes me a long time to do things. In particular, it takes me a long time to kind of line all my brain cells up and point them at a problem and actually get myself, you know, across that problem. And there are things that it, people will think I would take days to do that literally take years to do. And I'm really quite embarrassed by that. So I admittedly, I don't tend to admit it very much. Um, but, you know, I've had people say, um, things like oh she won't put the work in uh, about a period of time when i was absolutely slaving away and getting you know very very tired and stressed because i was being overworked uh and apparently you know i was not working enough for some people it's powerful at the same time but also it shows how people can think sometimes yes i mean you know i'm talking yeah. about sort of kindly disposed people who want the best for me but don't always understand you know what I need and don't understand how much silence and leaving alone I need. Mm. I remember going to um, an awards ceremony. Uh, this was just before lockdown came in. Um, and I loved lockdown because it, it gave me a chance to spend an awful lot of time alone. Um, and I was feeling sort of quite stressed. And after the dinner, um, 
most of my um, colleagues on the chase took themselves off to the bar and I was left alone at the table. And I was like, phew, uh, you know, I love my colleagues, obviously, but this is just a chance to just simply, instead of having people chatting in my ear, I can just simply focus on what's going on on the stage. And I swear over the next five minutes, like half a dozen women came shooting over to my table and sat down beside me and started chatting at me. It's like women see, you know, woman sitting alone at social event and they're like, ah, ah, this is a terrible thing. I have got to go and keep her company. And I, there's no way of saying to them, look, it's really kind of you, but what I was hoping to do was just not have to have a conversation going on on my left-hand side and instead be able to just sit here and watch what's going on on the stage. And they just there's there's no tactful way of saying that. So eventually, I just got up and left and went to the bar, you know, as well, and then went home. Uh, the last question I'd like to ask you is one really cool thing about you that you actually related to Queen Elizabeth and Robert the Bruce. That's right. Yes. Um. I mean, I think they managed to spin it on on DNA Journey as if this was a surprise to me. Actually, it wasn't a surprise to me. I, I figured it out. Um. When I was a teenager. Uh, just simply from reading. We didn't have the internet in those days, obviously, but you just, because my great, great, great grandfather I knew was a baronet. Um, and people like that tend to get written down in books and you can trace them back. So I simply used, um, Burke's, uh, oh, it's an old book called Burke's, not Burke's Peerage, Burke's Baronetage, uh, Knightage and Landed Gentry. Um, and I managed to figure it out from that. Um, and, uh, so it actually was something I know, and I'd sort of mentioned it to my mother, who was just very dismissive because she was always, because she was quite posh. She was sort of quite aware of the danger of being stuck up about things like this. Whereas, you know, all my working class friends were just going, Oh, wow, that's really cool and funny. Uh, which, you know, is what I thought it was. Uh, you know, my, my, I come from a cross class family. My mum was quite posh and my dad was um, a carpet fitter. So, uh, you know, dad's side of the family just thought it was amusing and entertaining. Uh, and mum was like, you know, don't tell anybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of, you know, tried to look interested and surprised when they told me on the show. But to be perfectly honest, I felt that my DNA journey was, you know, quite interesting. Sean's DNA journey was absolutely amazing. It was far more interesting. Uh, and that really, you know, is what I hope, if people watch the show back, I hope that's what they focus on. Um, because it was just extraordinary, you know, going up in the hills um, in Jamaica and actually seeing that plantation house that his ancestors um, were at, you know, originally, one of them originally as a slave and then as the actual lady of the house. So that was absolutely awesome. I loved that. Thank you, Anne, for such a great interview. It's just That's a okay. real pleasure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.